Amen. Uh, well, thanks for joining us this morning. And um, yeah, we begin this new sermon series in the book of Esther and this period of history, of Israel's history, where they're in exile. And uh, that might ring a bell. You might be very new to us here at the Lantern, but if you were with us back before Christmas and before the prayer course, we left the people of God in a similar time period in exile with Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. You might recognize those names. Now, Esther comes a little bit later in the story than Daniel. Uh, a little bit later than that. In fact, some of the people of Israel have begun probably to return to Jerusalem, to rebuild the wall, and we'll pick up on that part of the story in our next series after Esther. But for the next six weeks, here we are with this incredible story in the Bible. And um, it's a story as well that has so much to teach us today, as Jared has already hinted on. The theme for today's talk, as we intro the book and kind of help you into the story, is how to trust in God when he's nowhere to be seen. Trusting in God when he's nowhere to be seen. And I don't know if if you're anything like me, there are certainly times in the last nine or ten months where you might have asked something like this, God, what are you doing? What is going on? What are you trying to teach us? Are you still there? Are you listening? How is it that in the midst of this, you're working for our good? If you're anything like me, you might from time to time have asked those kind of questions. You might be this morning feeling very alone and uncertain of the future. And if you're in any of those categories, then I think this story of Esther has a huge amount to teach us. Trusting in God when he's nowhere to be seen. Now, you might be sitting there and thinking, well, how, Mike, is this story so relevant to our time? Well, let me introduce you a little bit to some of the characters in the stories, and you might begin to see what I mean. So, first of all, there's this king, this King Xerxes, who's a powerful, egomaniac, unstable leader who's obsessed with his own self-image and his trophy wife and throws money and propaganda around to demonstrate his power. As far as he's concerned, he is the ruler of the free world, and everyone is there to serve him. Then we have a dodgy politician who is career-obsessed and seems only to care about himself, not about the people he's meant to be caring for and looking looking out for, but just for himself and his own career. We have an oppressed minority group facing severe persecution and injustice. We have a people who are facing an uncertain future, facing even death, and are anxious and fearful. And I'm still talking about Esther, not about yesterday's news. So you can begin to see maybe how it might still, though this is from like the 5th century BC, how it might still have relevance to our lives today. And I hope we'll see that through the next few weeks as we journey through this together. So where is God? You see, the fascinating thing about this story, the story of Esther, in a, in a book that's meant to be all about God, well, a library of books that's all about God, Esther is a story that doesn't mention God's name once. More than that, it doesn't just mention, not mention his name. There's no mention of a temple, of any prayer, of any religious festivals, of all-night prayer meetings. There's no lion's dens. There's no falling down of Jericho's walls. There's nothing dramatic or miraculous to make us see the hand of God. So where is God? And why does the writer write it this way? Why is there no mention of God? Well, it's actually, of course, very deliberate. The writer of Esther must have seen what we we have the privilege of reading this uh, and reading the whole story and seeing the hidden hand of God, as we will through the story, um, uh, all the time. But it's not in the big and the extravagant miracles. It's in the ordinary and the everyday occurrences. And that's part of why this story, I think, is such a gift to us as a church at this time. Because I don't know about you, but if I reflect on my journey of faith, yes, there have been extraordinary moments, uh, seeing people healed, amazing guidance from God, prayers answered. But you know, a lot of the days are more ordinary. Trying to listen in to the whisper of God through the ordinary circumstances of life and navigate life a little bit better with the Spirit's guidance in that. And here we have a book that that doesn't have Jericho's uh, walls falling down, doesn't have Red Seas being parted, doesn't have 
uh, anything overtly miraculous or amazing. And yet we so clearly see the hand of God at work for the good of his people. And so I guess this is what you need to know. This is what you need to know. If you feel like God is absent, he isn't. If you feel at all, at the moment, like you're alone, you're not. And if you're unsure whether God is working for your good, he is. And we can know that from this story and from the experience of our lives, probably, as Christians as well, but from this story of Esther. So, the hidden hand of God. What am I talking about? Well, as you read this story, and let me briefly bring us up to where we are. We can't go through it verse by verse. It's quite a long reading we had. But just to bring you into the story, if you haven't read it yourself yet, I recommend you do, by the way. Make yourself a cup of tea this afternoon. Read the story. It won't take you too long. The tea will probably still be lukewarm by the time you've finished, um, and you can enjoy that as you go along. But here we are in this period of history, and we have these characters, um, particularly King Xerxes and Queen Vashti were introduced to in chapter 1. But notice uh, things that, that might seem ordinary, that just slip past you, but if they hadn't happened, the people of God wouldn't have been saved, which, by the way, is the end of the story. They are. It's a happy ending. But uh, King Xerxes um, holds this 180-day banquet to show off how powerful he is and how wealthy he is. And at one point, he's a little bit too worse for wear. He's had a few too many drinks, and he summons his beautiful trophy wife. And uh, his beautiful trophy wife, astonishingly, refuses to come. Now, this is extraordinary in this hierarchical culture that King Xerxes is the most powerful person in the world, period. And she refuses to his summons. And then we have um, uh, this rather hideous beauty pageant where Esther becomes queen. At the end of our reading for today, we have Mordecai overhearing a conversation. And you see, the hidden hand of God is so clear. I mean, if, if King Xerxes hadn't got a bit too worse for wear and summoned Queen Vashti, none of this would have happened. If Queen Vashti hadn't refused and therefore been deposed as queen, there wouldn't have been a vacancy for Esther. It wouldn't have happened. If Esther hadn't won the favor of countless people and then the favor of the king, she wouldn't have raised to power in a position where she could save her people. If Mordecai just happened, hadn't happened to be in the right place at the right time to hear this conversation, this plot to kill the king, the people wouldn't have been saved. If the king hadn't not rewarded him then, but held off his reward until he had insomnia one night, just happened to have insomnia one night, and just happened to have this story reread to him, and just happened to decide, oh, I must reward this person the very next day, then none of this would have happened. You get the picture. I won't ruin the whole story. But the hidden hand of God is there. And so, and notice as well how it's the ordinary, the everyday things, overhearing a conversation king getting a little bit too drunk. All these things, you might not even write in your journal at the end of the day, but it's in the ordinary and the everyday and the sometimes hidden that God is still at work. And so this is what you need to know. If it feels like God is absent, he isn't. If you feel at all ever like you're alone in work, in the hospital, homeschooling, as a single parent, you're not. And if you're wondering if God is working for your good, if he's still there and listening at all, he is. Now, I was discussing this with uh, Jamie and Jared earlier on this week, and um, uh, Jamie had a really good illustration, which I'm going to try and illustrate to you now. You see, there's circumstances sometimes that we have in life. I want to just acknowledge a slight elephant in the room here with God always being at work and us being able to see his hidden hand, because sometimes it doesn't work that neatly. You see, there are moments in life, and I imagine I'm walking through the, the journey of life, as it were, where in the moment stuff's happening and you can say, ah, oh, that's what God's doing. I get it. I can see what he's doing. And I've got Jamie to credit for this illustration. But um, there are other times you walk through life, and you don't see it at the time, but as you get to a certain point, you look back and you go, I see what you were doing there, God. I get it. But then there are other times 
where stuff happens in life, perhaps the most difficult stuff, perhaps stuff that's happening in your life right now, or to loved ones, to relatives you know, people we know within the church family, some of whom Jared mentioned in our prayers. Some of those in Indonesia wondering, thinking they're never going to see their family member again. People facing extreme poverty in the Yemen. It gets forgotten because of what's happening on Capitol Hill in the States. Wherever else it is, where it might not be in this lifetime, we never really understand what's going on or how God can be weaving that for good. We, we just don't get it. And that's when we need um, a mystery box. You see, sometimes there are things that are so confusing in life, where the hand of God seems so hidden. The responsibility of the Christian isn't to, to pretend that it doesn't happen, but just to go, you know what, I don't understand, and this time, this, this point in my life, and maybe never this side of eternity will I ever understand. But that experience, that thing, I'm just going to put in my mystery box. And I'm going to choose to trust and continue to walk, knowing that one day God will answer all those mysteries and all will be well. No more tears, no more death, no more pain. And I wonder for you this morning whether there's anything, even as I speak about that, that you're still holding in your hands that you haven't been able to trust God in and put in the mystery box. Perhaps the mystery box is still open and there's something that continues to cloud your mind and harden your heart. Perhaps the thing for you this morning is to identify that afresh, to ask God for the grace to put it in the mystery box and entrust it to him. Sometimes that's the reality. And that's maybe why it's particularly important, this book, to us. Because it's in the plain and the ordinary and sometimes in the painful and the confusing that we can trust still that God is at work. And why it's so important to us today is, well, think it. I didn't know that Jamie was going to reference Romans 15, 13, which we're talking about a lot before Christmas. But I didn't know he was going to mention that this morning. But it, those words all come up in what I'm about to say. Because think about if what you need to know is what we've said you need to know, and then the reason it's so important, why you need to know it, is think of the peace it could give us. Think of the joy it could give us. Think of the hope it could give us. If we truly allow the truth of this, the, the hidden activity of God, but he is always at work for our good, if that could sink deep into our soul. Think of the, the joy it could give us as we maybe reflect back on our journey of faith and see the maybe ordinary things that he has lined up and brought together for our good and for our blessing. That have given us favor, like at countless points, we read that Esther is given favor, has favor. And what joy that would give us as we reflected back on God's goodness in our lives. What peace it might give us in the present, in the moment of the journey that we're on now, to be able to say, it's okay. I know God's there. I know he's with me. In the middle of the shift in the hospital, when you're a single parent trying to homeschool your kids on top of everything else, when you're a teacher, when you're alone, when you've just lost your daughter, or struggling to understand the ill health of a relative. A transcendent peace. God is at work. He is not absent. He's there, and he is working for my good. And what about hope for the future? Because again, in the moment, we know that if things are not all well in the world, and we know that they're not, we know that it's not the end of the story. Joy for the past, peace in the present, hope for the future. So maybe this is what you need to remember this morning. Give thanks, ask for peace, hold on to hope. Give thanks, ask for peace, hold on to hope. We're nearly finished there, but I, as we come into land, I want to just draw our mind to, to one more thing, because a, a lot of this chapter that we've read, and we haven't been able to go through verse by verse, I do hope you read the story. There's this kind of hideous beauty pageant going on. 
And I want us to see as we finish, if you're, if you're someone watching and you're not yet a Christian, or you're just exploring the Christian faith, um, or you have... I want to draw your eyes, anyway, to King Xerxes and to how different he is to Jesus, to the king that Christians acknowledge and worship. You see, a lot of it, Esther has almost a year's worth of beauty treatments just to be ready to meet this king. Like, she, she needs a perfect tent, like a, the Strictly final. She has to absolutely nail it on one night. She has to do everything she can to win his favor. If she doesn't, then maybe she's sent back to his harem, her life over. Like, never called on or occasionally called on, never able to go and have a family or a life of her own. It's all on this one moment. She's got to impress the king, and if she messes up, that's it. And I think sometimes we can feel that that we've got to live this perfect life. We've got to get a perfect 10. We've got to do the best we can all the time. And if we don't, if we slip up, if we mess up, then we won't have the favor of the king of God and he'll discard us. And that is so far from the God of the Bible that we read about. So far from the God of the Bible that we read about. King Xerxes is the king of your nightmares. Jesus is the king of your dreams. You see, Esther has to be perfect and flawless, beautiful and flawless to impress the king, that he might love her. Jesus loves you just as you are, despite your flaws, to make you beautiful. The God of the Bible is nothing like King Xerxes. Esther has to give up her life and her freedom to serve King Xerxes. The Jesus we worship gives up his life to give us life and freedom and purpose and joy. And that reality, the more you recognize and receive and believe in this Jesus, it makes all the difference in the world to whatever you're facing. Trusting in God when he's nowhere to be seen becomes a lot easier, not just because we can give thanks for his hand in the past and have peace in the present and hold on to hope for the future, but because this Jesus has won our hearts, mine and your hearts, and you know that he accepts you despite your flaws and your failures, that he loves you to make you lovely, to give you purpose and hope and joy. So let me pray as we finish.